for asking me to come along and tell you long-winded stories about what we do at OSIS. Um, it's, a, it's very much a, a Christchurch Canterbury story, um, and it is one that started uh, a long time ago. Just to give uh, a bit of a uh, bit of an introduction, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm actually a, a toolmaker by trade, um, and served my time at uh, uh, had the pleasure of serving my time at Hamilton Jet here in Christchurch. Um, so my background is uh, very much from uh, a uh, talk, from a trade background rather than an academic background. But uh, very uh, early on in the piece, I uh, bumped into a, an orthopaedic surgeon that was uh, really excited in uh, jet boats at the time, to be honest. And uh, I was uh, very excited in anything that wasn't jet boats. So uh, we kind of hit it off and uh, started a few businesses. Now, I'm going to discuss OSIS and explain what OSIS uh, uh, is and what we do. And uh, hopefully that helps set some... Uh, context to um, what the value of, of, of imaging outside or sort of on the fringe of what you'd normally use imaging for in diagnostics. So a little bit of history as I know it around our business. So our business, just to, just to explain exactly what it is, we're dealing with uh, really complex uh, pathology, um, mainly in orthopaedics, for people that are really extremely unlucky, the multiply operated on, people that have had um, uh, a bad run for a whole lot of reasons, and it could be just um, uh, through through disease, through trauma, um, and uh, but they tend to turn up on our doorstep when they're in an extremely bad way. Now, where all this started, uh, in my recollection, uh, and the stories I've heard. Through, through over the years, is uh, there was a, um, a fellow by the name of Neville Turner worked in medical physics in Christchurch DHB, um, and he was working with a young uh, orthopaedic surgeon that turned up from, uh, come back from Oxford University, and uh, they had a particularly nasty uh, uh, a case of a sarcoma, and a pelvis, pelvic sarcoma, um, and they uh, had two options, uh, hind quarter, um, or, or at that time, uh, using an allograft um, to patch the patient up, remove the tumour, um, and use an allograft. So uh, one thing led to another, and they uh, and they decided that they have a go at uh, actually building a custom implant. So this was in, in 90, about 96, um, I think the, the case started. So that was that was really the seed for an idea of in, a local seed for an idea of actually building custom implants to deal with these big big uh, tumour cases in particular, and then it moved on to revision. So the way this sort of bounced around in 97, Neville Turner um, uh, built this first custom implant for a 73-year-old woman from Gore, um, and that was, uh, at the time, it was very successful. That, that was an implant that was built out of taking uh, CT data images and, and literally profiling them and slapping pieces of plywood together to, to build a... Um, to, to build a model, to build the implant on. And then f from, from there, uh, we, there was a really quite a, a, a huge leap when we could print, we could, we could 3D print those biomodels, those anatomical models. So we could take the CT data, we could convert it, and we could print an anatomical model. And that was um, a huge leap for us, and that was in 98. And that was the first 3D printer that came into New Zealand. Um, it had only been here a few months, and we were building uh, biomodels on. The max face surgeons, the maxillofacial surgeons, um, really took it on with uh, a lot of gusto because it gave them a whole lot more insight um, and pre-op planning and interoperative planning and the ability to build and modify um, plates. So that was way back in the, in, the, in the 90s. Then very soon after, we were able to take that CT data and bring it into a CAD system, and that allowed us to, be, to, to, allowed us to machine implants. So we would take a big lump of titanium or stainless steel and we could machine the implants. So we're whittling them down out of a, a lump of steel. Slow process, but it still gave us the ability to create a form that fitted our patient. Um, and then uh, pretty soon after that, uh, we started getting approached uh, by some, uh, we had cases turning up that were involving, more and more involving tumors. and. That was something that was really hard for us to understand because not having a medical background, we knew there was something that we couldn't do ourselves was define tumour margin. Um, 
we had a workshop full of engineers. They weren't medically trained. So we enlisted a company over out of the States, um, Medical Modeling, and they demonstrated a, a technique of uh, registering CT and MR, and that gave, gave us a better understanding of where these margins, these tumour margins were. And at the end of the day, we still never diagnose, um, and even today we don't diagnose tumour margin. Um, all we do is, is uh, pull the data together so that we understand what's given to us from our clinicians and then we apply it um, rather than doing it ourselves. So, so there we get to where we are um, today and uh, we process, uh, we do about 100 odd cases a year um, where we're dealing with uh, revision patients, so processing data sets. We're about 100 data sets that we process each, each year. And this is traditional data. This is um, generally X-ray, CT, and uh, MRI. So as I sort of mentioned before, our patients are the hard patients. They're the multiply operated on. Um, these patients are, have uh, turn up and they will have had, uh, when I say multiple, you know, 10 or a dozen or more surgeries trying to rectify, trying to get some stability back into a joint, whether it be a knee or a hip. They've got massive bone loss um, and they really are in a bad way. The added complication around all of this is that these patients are scarred up. Um, so after multiple surgeries, they're scarred up. So what we are looking at at our end is hard tissue. Pretty much sure we can see we can see a little bit of vascularization with the software and the technology that we have. Um, but when our surgeons are getting in um, to the uh, getting in the middle of surgery, you've got those vessels all hidden in scar tissue, which then compromises the, the integrity of that scar tissue. So when you think about the planning and the pre-op planning, we're still going in there with one eye shut, basically, and we're although. These are 3D image, images that we're we and 3D forms that we're working with. Um, there's still not a lot of uh, not a lot of depth. So we've done the team have done up to now about 350 patients, or well, no, closer to closer to 400 patients, and about 80% of those have been done in the last seven or eight years. So we really felt our way along. The first patient we did um, using. Uh, really working with imaging data and all the imaging technologies that we could was only about 2007. Now, previous to that, we still worked off a lot of X-rays and a bit of CT, but you know, as things have progressed, um, imaging is forming a bigger and bigger part of our, our business. One thing we've noticed is uh, that uh, over the years is that the amount of data that uh, needs to be needs to be managed. Um, there's lots of data. Um, and uh, also the cases are getting more and more complex. Cases that we saw 10 years ago that we thought were bad, hard, difficult cases, are, um, we're seeing less of those. And that's predominantly to the treatment methods and the earlier intervention. So we're not seeing those ones. But the ones that slip under the radar, they're the ones that turn up and really cause us um, cause us a lot of grief. So the more data we're getting, the more issues we've got around trying to manage that. Um, and so that is one ongoing issue on, a, on, a, on a, almost a, a, a monthly basis is, is working out how to, how to deal with it and the amount of time it's taking to, to process data. So the challenges we face um, is, is, is creating a level of confidence. Um, it, it is uh, not uncommon for us to spend uh, a day, a full day, eight hours, 10 hours, um, even more, uh, trying to interpret the imaging data that we're, we're seeing. You know, what, what are we actually, is what we think we see um, actually there? Because when you see the state of the um, uh, patients that turn up and the amount of hardware they have, we're in the situation where everything is hidden. And our critical spot for, for, an, for, for an acetabulum is, is very much immediately adjacent to the acetabulum. But the trouble is with the imaging, certainly with CT, is, is a lot of that is hidden because of the artifact um, and it's shadowing. And uh, so therefore we approach this um, with using as much um, 
uh, information as we possibly can. So we use our CT data, sorry, our CT scans are used alongside our, our X-rays, our functional X-rays. Um, but then that's another problem when you've got these patients and they're, they're, they're severely compromised. How do you put them through a functional range of motion that's going to give us information and enough information so that we know where we're placing our components are in, is the right place to place them? Because you can have a poorly placed component uh, hip uh, cup in a, in a patient and stem, and it'll never dislocate. And you can have a re very well placed component in a patient, and it will dislocate. So again, as I said earlier, what we're, look, what we're looking at at the moment, we feel, we've got to the point, we feel that we're looking at something really with one eye shut because we can see all the hard tissue and we understand the hard tissue. Um, but can you, from a, a, if a, an experienced surgeon will tell you um, and sigh when he sees this case because he's going to be thinking, now are those, are those structures, are those nerves, are those blood vessels in the places they should be because over a period of time, uh, patients scarred up. This, this degeneration of the joints happened over a long period of time. So things start getting really vague about what's where and what's hiding, um, what's hiding where. So our favourite subject in the office is very much um, artefact. Um, and this is why we love x-rays. Um, the image on your left is a slice of a CT. Um, and the image on the right is an X-ray of uh, the same patient. So, this is where we, we work in conjunction with we work with both modes because we can see in the CT um, this look kind of looks and feels like there's something there. But uh, once you look at the X-ray, it can help you just define is that is that a bit of bone or is that a bit of cement? Um, is it something worth worrying about? Um, how, how 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 hard is it going to be to remove what's attached to it? Um, so it's. We're in a situation now where we have our patients, um, they go through a protocol for, for, for x-ray um, as well as, as CT. One thing that we're doing more and more for our oncology cases um, is uh, really getting uh, heavily involved with the, uh, the surgical team um, because uh, margin is, is, so, is, is such a is such a critical thing. You need to have a clear margin with these tumours. But then we're getting pushed by the fact that these tumours are getting so large. When you look at this image here, um, this, is a, this is a massive case. You know, for us, you get excited because it's not in the acetabulum and you get really disappointed because it might be in the sacrum. So every millimetre of bone, healthy bone we can save, uh, gives us a better chance of getting a long-term re result for these patients. It's going to make a difference. This is where the anxiety kicks in for the team um, in the office. Yesterday, uh, we get a new case turn up, and it's a 12-year-old. Um, and so first thing we're doing, everybody's wanting to see, right, we have, we have exit tumour. It's a 12-year-old patient have exit tumour. Um, because we'll want to take the finest margin we possibly can, but uh, God help us if we leave anything behind, because then we've wasted everybody's time and we've, we've, we've risked this patient's life um, and future. So. Uh, Getting, getting detailed, get the reg registration has been something that we've been uh, perfecting and working um, with for a number of years. And again, we do all this part in the office in Christchurch, and then we'll ship it all over to our, our, our prescribing surgeon, and it'll go to the team, and then they'll come back and say, "Well, we want to set the margin here. We want, we, you know, we we don't know about what's going on here, so we're going to try this." And so at the moment, it's because it's, it's, not, it's not yet, um, you know, it's, it's not yet a, a science. It's more, still more of an art form. It's, it's, a, it's, it's uh, you know, we're sitting there um, and uh, defining this the best we possibly can, um, but there's still a, still a, a margin, of, there can still be a margin of, of error. Um, and the, the human component of it uh, is, uh, Something that uh, uh, is, is our, is our, at, at times is our, is our biggest risk. So the outputs we get from imaging um, really are the foundation for everything we do. So once we get the imaging, and if we've got confidence in that imaging, the outputs are, are the foundation. So we build uh, 
we build our implants, we plan off this. It's also a canvas for communication. We can put it in front of our surgeons, we can put it in front of our engineers. Um, it, it is, and we put, we use it to, we put it in front of our funders to try and get them to understand, well, you know, this is what we're dealing with, what's the option? Because we produce a product that is extremely expensive in comparison with a primary hip replacement. It's a multiple times more expensive. So funders, as you can imagine, um, Certainly, the uh, private uh, funders get a little bit excited when you turn up with a with a joint replacement for a patient of theirs that's three times the price of uh, a primary joint. So it's uh, it's uh, used uh, all over, and, and it has huge value in multi multiple parts of the of, of of the business. So therefore, the accuracy um, of that um, you can see makes a makes a huge difference because. Um, the uh, you know, once we get into a procedure, there's no going back. So once we're committed, there's no going back. So so getting getting more understanding more um, early on is uh, is of uh, is of huge value to us. So we get really excited when we deal and talk with the Mars guys, and we call them the Mars guys, and their name gets bandied around our office all the time. Um, and also one or two of the clinicians that we're working with, um, sarcoma surgeons um, over in Australia, um, we've introduced to Anthony and Phil, and uh, they are extremely excited about what this may offer. Um, as Anthony mentioned, this uh, technology, uh, you know, and we are looking at it, as Anthony mentioned, that it's a cross between MR and CT. Um, we've done some studies with, with, uh, with Mars, and uh, so far, what we have seen, we're finding exceptionally exciting. And we see it as it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it really adds value to what we do, um, and that's being rather, rather self-centred um, on what we do in a lot of areas. It gives us a better understanding on how our implants are performing. Now we're, we're making implants, and we've got a goal to make implants lasting, to last 30 years. The longest implant we've got in um, is 14 years, so we've got a wee way to go. But it'd be good to know what's happening in behind those implants. You know, we have we have a real focus on mechanical matching, trying to mechanically match the implant to the bone, so it really it, it drives osseointegration, it drives stability because it's mechanically matched. It's not too stiff, it's not too not, not too soft. It's not going to fatigue and fracture, but it's not going to hammer its way through and end up in a blooming kidney. Sometimes implants tend to go that way. Um, the, uh, the 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 ideal is to get something that is stimulating that bone growth, is stimulating that bone remodeling. And we think that, that what we've seen so far with Mars uh, technology, it has, it has so many applications, um, and uh, we're extremely excited to see where it goes. So uh, for us, uh, where, do, where do we go from here? Because what I'm trying to paint a picture of is, is, is what we see our business and the way we operate right now is quite uh, is uh, is almost quite archaic. We're still uh, doing our best, looking at an image with with and being able to glean uh, a certain amount of information out of those uh, that the imaging and the data that's sent to us. But uh, there's a whole lot more hidden in there, and uh, we get ex again get ex 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 exceptionally excited. Um, we're really excited about the the, the um, Mars Tech because it's going to give us a lot more. You know, we can we can understand what bone health is doing. We can understand where the the, the, the strong bone is and where the rubbish is because sometimes, and a lot of times, we get excited about thinking we've got a got a good solid piece of bone, um, and it's not. Or vice worst case is vice versa when um, uh, we think we've got uh, we think we've got. Um, We've got it all dialed in, and it's and it's the opposite. And we've got a loose implant after um, a short period of time. So everything is moving through forward to everything is moving towards accuracy. Uh, I mentioned before about the uh, margins. We started off uh, dealing with margins of two centimeters on, around a tumor, um, two centimeters. Now we're talking to surgeons that are talking about millimeters. Um, and when surgeons start talking about millimeters, you get worried. Um, and they uh, and the, the advent of navigation, and we've been navigating our products, for our implants for quite some time, um, in certain centres, and that's adding to accuracy. But 
you know, we can be as, and, and we manufacture our implant within microns, and that's fantastic. But what, why, why make an implant that, that you can, uh, why make an implant to a, a micron tolerance when um, we don't have anywhere near that from our imaging and our scanning? So, um, you know, it, it is a, uh, it's an exciting place to be in, in our business because of all the technology that's now turning up. And when we started this, we'd turn up and talk to an orthopedic surgeon and say, hey, we can make anything. And he'd look at us blankly because sometimes you need somewhere to start. And I think where we are right now, we've got the start. We've found limitations in the, in the technologies that we're currently using. And there needs to be that next big step. And all the technology, all the medical technology around uh, you know, true rot robotics, surgical robots, um, and guidance is all relying on imaging of some, to some description. And so again, I go back, if your foundation isn't solid, um, then it really doesn't matter what your house is like. So, that's me done. Um, any questions?